Shalom from Colorado. Um, I'm here getting ready, working on my book writing, which is called The Last Hour, which is going to describe all the things that are happening in the world right now, and how John, First John, when he says, Beloved, this is the last hour, and I believe that we are indeed living in the last hour. Um, but I wanted to update you about something completely, um, you know, relevant and very, very disturbing. Over the last few weeks, I've been updating all of you about the things that are happening with Russia in the Middle East and the things that are happening most specifically in Syria. And I think that it was about a 10 days ago or so that um, I... Uh, I kind of estimated that President Putin answers all the criteria for being uh, Gog, the Prince of Magog, and, and somehow he will be taking personally, I believe, a very important role in the coming Gog and Magog war, the Ezekiel 38 and 39. Well, the last time I updated you, and from Israel, when I was in my house, right uh, next to the Valley of Armageddon, I updated you about um, the uh, deployment of the SA-23 um, uh, gladiator slash giant missile system that uh, Vladimir Putin put uh, in Syria in order to paralyze any uh, potential cruise missile attack from the American 6th uh, Fleet on the Mediterranean. But, as you all know, things are uh, escalating rapidly in the Middle East, but not only in the Middle East. In my last update, I, uh, I told you that P Putin is extremely um, worried about NATO's deployment in the eastern flank of their uh, territory, specifically in the area of Romania, where they recently had a massive buildup of forces and a deployment of an anti-missile uh, um, anti defense system, um, which also can serve eventually also as a way to launch its own uh, ballistic missiles that can carry nuclear warheads. So as far as Putin concern, NATO and America standing in its top is actually uh, provoking him to do something. So whatever he is doing, is actually reacting but not just acting and that's what he's he's trying to say to the whole world and it's interesting because in the last 48 hours Vladimir Putin did something that has not been done since the days of the Cold War we know that he just deployed what we call the Iskandar or Iskander missiles in Kaliningrad, which is the westernmost city in the Russian territory, right next to the, uh, um, ac across from Kaliningrad, it's basically Finland, in the uh, area of Western Europe. What the Iskandar are, are actually basically um, um, missiles. This is a missile system that Russia developed in 2006. And uh, we're talking about a, a system that can carry nuclear warhead. Basically, Vladimir Putin is now stationing nuclear missiles right in front of the Western world. Now, why is it so interesting? Normally, the Russians will deny all of, of, all of such things. They will all say that this is the fruit of the um, imagination of the West. This is a different story. This is the first time that the Russians not hide anything, but they actually move those missiles right along the path of the American satellite, so the Americans will see it, so the Europeans will see it, so the world will see it. And if that's not enough, the Russian military spokesman went out yesterday and said, first of all, the authors behind the fuss should know that the Iskander missile system is mobile one. Basically, he says, you know, we're not uh, situating anything permanently. This is just a mobile one. We just travel with it. Second, he said, this is part of the combat training plan unit 
of uh, and the unit of the Russian missile forces throughout the year improve their marching capability by con by uh, covering great distances across the territory of the Russian Federation in various ways by air, sea, and on their own. This is General Igor Konashenkov, who is the spokesman of their army. So, what do we see here? We see that Russia is confirming to the world, both in action by moving it under the radar, and un excuse me, right under the satellite uh, eyes, but also the spokesman says, hey, yes, we are doing that. We're actually, uh, it's part of our maneuver, uh, military uh, operation. And you shouldn't be alarmed because this is a normal thing. This is baloney because it's not a normal thing. You don't just place nuclear missiles and, and say it's a normal thing. Um, you don't send millions of your people to the bomb shelter to assimilate nuclear attack. And you don't uh, deploy thousands of soldiers in many different front lines with the uh, order to get ready for a nuclear exchange if it's only a, a, a military maneuver or a military exercise. Russia right now is playing a very dangerous game in which it says, A, America, we're not even afraid to hit you on your soil with nuclear weapon. Two, we are not going to take any orders from you in regards to what is going on in Syria. In fact, I'm, Putin says, I'm going to work with the Chinese on my war plan and how I'm going to sort out the problem in the Middle East, in Syria in particular. And now I don't need the help of the West, I don't need the help of anyone, because all you do is actually sabotaging my interest. We must understand that we are on the brinks of a nuclear war in, um, in this world. It, it, it's interesting, Mikhail Gorbachev, the, the former president of Russia, says that we are in a very dangerous uh, times right now. And I, I'm not talking about Americans, I'm not talking about Europeans, I'm talking about the Russian former president who is not uh, biased because obviously he, he understand what's going on. And he said the following thing. But one more thing that I wanted to, to, to mention is um, Putin always sends people to the cameras to say what he wants them um, to convey as far as message to the world. When he speaks, um, no one listens. So he says, you know what, I'm going to send a TV host, uh, someone who, who is... Um, who is known to be uh, attacking the West on an ongoing uh, pattern. His name is um, Dmitry Kiselyov. And Dmitry uh, Kiselyov um, has a late night show. And yesterday he said the following thing. He said he delivered uh, a message to Washington in his last night's edition in, in the news. And look what he says. He says, a Russian takes a long time to harness a horse, but then rides fast. It, it, by basically what he did, he quotes uh, a famous Russian saying, by riding fast, it means that Kislev says basically, um, uh, it, it's a string of the, all the recent Russian military deployments. And what are they? Last week, we're talking about uh, Russia sent three warships from the Black Sea Fleet to the Mediterranean, and on board, there's cruise missiles that can carry nuclear warheads. The second thing, Russia deployed the nuclear-capable Iskander missiles, the M missiles that we talked about, into Kaliningrad, which I just mentioned. Russia announced it would send several hundred paratroopers to Egypt for military exercise. Watch that. And Moscow, as I reported last week, also suspended the three nuclear agreements with the United States. So, what do we have here? We have here a Russian defiance of the West and particularly America. And he's not doing that now uh, for nothing. These are the last three months of a sitting president in the White House. This is what we call lame duck. We, this is what we call um, a trap because no president is going to go out to war 27 days um, before elections unless 
and I'm stressing it out, unless that president has an interest in postponing the elections or not even having them at all. It's going to be very interesting. The next 27 days are going to be very, very crucial. The big question right now is, will President Barack Obama take the road of suspending the elections or postponing or even canceling them and confront Russia? Or will he continue on his route of completely giving up all that is left from America's uh, dignity in, in this whole relationship with Russia. Basically, what the Russian president is doing right now is humiliating the American president. There, I, mean, I cannot find other words. He understands that the American president is in a weak situation right now, and he's hammering him hard, hard and hard, knowing that maybe the only thing that can happen in order to, for the Americans to retaliate is going, obviously, also to affect the elections. I've warned uh, many times in the past that the elections in America are the actual single thing that um, causes everything uh, in, in the Middle East and in Europe to escalate. And the reason is people understand that there is a, date there is a deadline, there is a date that they must act before in order to get what they want. And I'm just wondering how is it all going to affect the Middle East? Because I may, if I may say, I don't think that the Russian president really wants to start a nuclear war with America. What he really wants is actually to act alone without any interference in the Middle East. It's in the Middle East that Russia can operate freely without bearing any consequences, without, without having to be even... Um, um, uh, I would say, um, without having to give any, any accountability to anyone. That's what he's been doing. He's been bombing Aleppo like crazy, and no one does anything. The Security Council is meeting once and twice and three times and four times. Is something done? No, nothing will be done, because the Russians are making it very clear that they're not going to, uh, they're not going to even uh, answer any order, neither from the UN or from the United States. So what is happening now is a big, big, um, um, I would say, uh, way to uh, deter the attention of the world to Russian-American confrontation so he can act in, in whatever fashion and manner he wants in the Middle East. In the Middle East, he can drop bombs. In the Middle East, he can deploy soldiers. In the Middle East, he can, he can deploy missile defense systems. He can do whatever he wants. Nobody's going to hold him accountable. He cannot do that with America. He cannot do that with NATO. And so he is frightening. He is um, threatening um, both NATO and America, but he's acting. He's operating in Syria. And this is where I believe Ezekiel 38 and 39 are coming to the picture. We see right now an America that is not really um, relevant to what is going on in the Middle East. We see a Russian president that is actually taking the lead in all that is going on in Syria. And we see that he just visited Ankara to meet with Erdogan. He's just signing, peace, uh, signing uh, treaties with the Iranian. We see that the, the entire um, alliance between Russia, the Turks, and the Iranians is gaining strength. And everything else that Russia does with the West is actually just to get the attention away from that which they are doing in Syria. Now, I'm not scared. I don't think the believers should be scared. I think that we should smile because really, Jesus never really uh, promised us the Garden of Roses. If anything, one of the main ways for us to understand that we live in the very last days, in, as John said, the last hour, is following the signs that Jesus gave us in Matthew 21, in, in Matthew 24 and in Luke 21. I I beg you not to follow some false teachings and false teachers about other signs and other things that you know Jesus never even mentioned. Let's stick to the Bible. Let's stick to all the things that Jesus mentioned as the signs of the end. 
of the age. And then Jesus said to all of us, not only in John 16, 33, when he says, in this world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Jesus said, this is the time for all the believers not to be uh, beaten, not to be uh, very discouraged. For us, the description in 1 Thessalonians 5 ends up with, so therefore, encourage one another with these things as you do. So, so my point is this. As we, the believers, see that which is going on around the world, we must understand that we are in the position of those who have hope and those who have encouragement that A, Jesus already won and he have overcome the world. So we must hold on to that victory. And B, we must hold on to the promise, the blessed hope from Titus 2.13 of the, of the appearance. And, 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 and the blessed hope of Jesus basically is that he will come and take us. Jesus said, don't worry. I am going now to the Father, but I will come back and I will receive you. The word in the Greek to receive means he's not going to come all the way to the earth to, to, to take us. He's going to receive us. We're going to go up to be received by him. And so he can take us to where he is. The believers should not go through the great tribulation. They are going to be received, they are going to be received by Jesus so he can shelter them from the horrible things that are going to happen in this world. I just finished uh, uh, two messages that I gave in Garden City, Kansas on the, on the um, rapture of the church and on the great tribulation, on the um, Antichrist actually. I'm looking forward to the conference in um, Eden Prairie in Minnesota. Uh, the Understanding the Times Conference of Olive Tree Ministries of Jan Markell. I'll be sharing the pulpit with speakers like Ann Graham Lotz and Mark Hitchcock and Bill Kenning and others. And I, and I know that uh, Michelle Bachman is going to be there as well and I'm so looking forward to seeing her. She's a very good friend. And I, I, I'm looking forward to it because as much as we need to understand what is going on and as much as we need to to have, as Daniel said, I, I, I received an understanding. That which we see around us can really confuse people. But we must pray that God will give us an understanding. And the understanding that God can give us as believers can only be based on scriptures. Not on feelings, not on assumption, not on emotions, not on any sources of, of news or, or, or some sort of conspiracy website. No. Our understanding must come directly from the Lord himself through his word. The Lord gave us all the tools to be prepared, to be ready, not only to understand, but also to equip ourselves so we are ready. And I want to urge you not to lose hope. I want to urge you not to go into that doom and gloom um, state of mind. If you're a believer, the Bible is promising us wonderful things. We just have to hold on. We just have to take a deep breath. We just have to endure those tribulations that we see in John 16, 33. But we must have and hold on to that blessed hope that is shortly coming to take us and receive us unto himself. For the non-believers, you really need to be scared. You really need to be afraid. The things that this world is about to go through right now are things that the world has never seen in the history. It will start with some nuclear exchange, as Ezekiel says, but it will evolve into the appearance of a horrible man, a man of sin, that will do terrible things in the latter part of his reign, and he will lead the world to the most dangerous and the most apocalyptic and the most destructive era in the history of planet Earth. I don't want anyone to be lost. I, I think that it's very clear, unlike what some teaches that God destined people or predestined people to do hell. No, the Bible says that God does not, 
is uh, not into that. God wants all to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. So all will be taken and all will have eternal life and all will return with him in his glorious appearance. All means all. God loved the world, not just the church, when he gave his only begotten son. So we must preach the word like like never before, like and never before. We must be all about our Father's business right now. We must be encouraged. These are amazing times. Don't lose hope. Don't lose your uh, your your uh, only thing that distinguish, uh, distinguishes us from the rest of the world. Be about our Father's business. Be filled with the Spirit. Be in the Word. And be a, a very discerning people. Please do me a favor. Don't, I mean 90% of the websites and Facebook groups and all of that that are dealing with end times are full of fantasies. And, and then what happens is they report things, and when those things aren't coming to pass, none of them even apologizes, or none of them even uh, says that you know he should be standing corrected. No. So let's calm down and focus on that which God gave us as believers in this world. I, uh, I want... I wanted to record this Facebook Live right now, A, because I wanted to encourage people, but B, because I think that God is on the move for something much greater, and we need to prepare ourselves. It'll be nice if you write where you're from as you uh, write your comments. We really want to understand um, where people are from, the people that are watching us, and the people that are um, engaged in, in, in the ministry. And um, I want to um, I want to really uh, send you blessings on a very solemn day. Today is Yom Kippur. Today is the Day of Atonement. Today is a day where the Jewish nation is fasting and praying for forgiveness of sins. And on this day, as the world is going crazy, my prayer is that the people, my people, the people of Israel will open their eyes to understand that the real atonement and the real forgiveness and the real redemption comes from the offering that has been made 2,000 years ago. The Bible in Leviticus 23, when it describes the Day of Atonement, doesn't talk about fasting, believe it or not. It talks about, and you should afflict your souls, not your body. Jewish rabbis interpreted that as fasting, but it's interesting. When the Bible talks about fasting, it mentions fasting. Here, it's not fasting. Here, it's you should afflict your souls. And what is to afflict your soul? To afflict your soul is to come to the understanding that by your own strength, you can do nothing to save yourself. By your own strength, you cannot save yourself. You cannot redeem yourself. By your own strength, you cannot get forgiveness of sins. It is all about that offering that was done, given uh, 2,000 years ago. And so my prayer is the eye, that the eyes of my people will open to understand the true meaning of Yom Kippur, the true meaning of the atonement, the true meaning of the real sacrifice and the lack of necessity anymore to fast for forgiveness of sins and to fast for redemption because it has been done already. All we need is to believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he whosoever believes in him, not fast, not, 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 not doing some things, actions that later on he will feel good with himself all about. No, no. Every Israeli is asking the other Israelis after... Yom Kippur, did you fast? Did you fast? How was it? Did you fast? Oh, yeah. I fasted. Mm, good for you. It's all about pride. And, and, you know, I fasted. Look at me. I'm holy. Many times you see that the wish that they wish each other before is have an easy fast. So since when fast should be easy? And then if you fast, then why do you brag about it? Why do you have to ask others, did you? Because you did. My prayer and my, my hope, like Paul's was when he talked about it in Romans 10, 
is that my people, my countrymen, will be saved. And salvation, yes, it is of the Jews. It came 2,000 years ago through the Jewish people, through the people of Israel. And his name is Yeshua. Yeshua means salvation. That's his name. He is our salvation. He is our redemption. Through him, we can be saved. There is no other name by which or under the heaven by which man can be healed or saved. So, this is our prayer. This is my prayer on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, that my people will open their eyes. And my prayer for all of you on this special day is that we will be greatly encouraged that the things that Jesus promised that characterizes the end times as they happen all around us will cause us to look up and see that our redemption, the redemption of the body is drawing near. Our rapture is drawing near. This is the blessed hope. I cannot understand how anyone live without that hope and yet be a follower of Jesus. All those that talk about the fact that there is no rapture basically takes the only promise that give, Jesus could give to his followers. We're not of this world. We should not go through the things that God is going to afflict this world with. He says that he will, he will save us and he will protect us from, not through. We must um, look up and, and, and really... Uh, praise the Lord that our rapture, our salvation, our redemption, our rapturo, herpazo is in the Greek, it is indeed drawing near. It's not a fantasy. It's hard to believe because, you know, we're going to lose gravity. But the Bible says in First, in first Corinthians 15 that we're all going to be changed. And it's not going to happen when the world is going to even notice when a twinkling of an eye, in a moment, we will be changed. We'll be gone before they even notice. It's not the second coming that the whole world is going to seem. Every eye will see His coming. No. The rapture will be swift. It will be fast. And it will be very decisive. You don't want to be left behind. You don't want to because the life of anyone who accepts Christ during the tribulation will be so horrible, so bad. They will be the saints of the tribulation. It will, I mean, now it's the time. The Son of Man is in His first cam uh, coming came to save the world. But the second coming will be to judge the world. We do not want to be here on earth when He comes back. We want to be with Him as He comes back and come back with Him. The rapture is Christ coming for the church. The second coming is Christ is coming with the church. We want to come back with Him. We want to be with Him in heaven while the world is being judged. And we, know, we want to come back with Him and rule and reign with Him for a thousand years and then enter into that amazing eternity um, forever and ever with Him. What a wonderful promise. So, don't be doom and gloom. Don't be sad. Don't be anxious. Don't be so, so concerned. That which is happening now should happen. It will happen. And it's good that we understand it. We will receive, we receive the, an understanding, a warning. God in His amazing grace has revealed that to us. That these things should happen. So why are we even worried or even perplexed or even um, concerned? When he told us these things will happen. So I want to bless you with um, a shalom, a peace. But the peace that surpasses all understanding will only come from him, the Prince of Peace. Thank you and God bless you from uh, Denver, Colorado. Soon I'm going to be in Minneapolis, then in Rome, in Italy, then back in Israel. I love you all. Stay strong. Have the blessed hope.